What's up everybody, my name is Zach Rudrup and you're listening to the It's Not A Phase podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by M. Foster of the punk band Nervous to talk all about their fourth album, The Evil One. We also discuss the experience of self-producing the album in Northumberland, working with Dylan Baldy of Cloud Nothings, some of the societal and political influences on the record, the choice of a metal sounding album title and the album cover, and loads more. Before we get started, let's cover off the boring stuff. If you enjoy this episode and would like to support the podcast, please consider subscribing, rating, and leaving a review wherever you're listening to this. We also have a Patreon, where everyone gets access to each episode a week earlier than everyone else, and a merch store too. You can also follow and reach out to me on social media. All the links can be found at it's not a phase co.uk that's it's not a phase co.uk and with all that out of the way let's jump right into this week's episode of it's not a phase what's up everybody thanks for joining me on this episode of it's not a phase where i'm joined by m of nervous how are you doing hey yeah i'm good thank you i'm good enjoying the sunshine from inside as it should be enjoyed exactly, yeah. <laughs> no sunburn when you're inside so no <laughs> So, um, you know, the, the big news is the fourth Nervous album, The Evil One. How does it feel to be finally putting this record out? Uh, it feels great. We, we recorded it in August last year. So it's kind of the longest that we've ever waited between recording an album and releasing it. Most of the time, that's kind of like a, maybe like a three month delay between recording it and releasing it. So we've been sat on it for a little while longer than we have a lot of the other stuff that we've put out. So yeah, it's exciting to finally get it out. It's also exciting to be releasing an album when there's shows happening. Because in between Tough Crowd and this record, we, we did a few EPs and stuff, but obviously couldn't play any shows. So yeah, it's cool. It's um, definitely, definitely exciting to be able to reconnect with like people in actual physical rooms as well. So yeah. Yeah, I guess you can give this new material, you know, actually time to showcase it live. Like you say, you, you know, you've, you've done a bit of material between these two records, but they've not really had their true time to shine, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. Just put them on the shelf and uh, <laughs> keep on <them> walking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is also your first release um, under a new label you with Get Better Records now Yes Previously with Big Scary Monsters What made you want to move to that label in particular um, You know, after, after being with Big Scary Monsters for the past two full lengths? Um, I think Get Better Records basically I guess it seemed to be like a kind of a fluid transition I guess from, from one label to the other They, They're a queer and trans artist run record label and my friend Koji works very closely with them, for them. And so it seemed like basically the perfect fit, you know. So, yeah, it was that's kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple. <laughs> yeah. I believe, you know, with, with the, as you kind of put in the first kind of foundations for this record, you were doing some uh, songwriting classes with uh, Dylan Baldy of Cloud Nothings. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Dylan tweeted about doing guitar lessons, but more kind of um, songwriting focused guitar lessons. And right. at that point, we weren't playing. There's no shows. We were, well, I was basically writing some demos towards a new record, but I wasn't feeling particularly inspired. So, yeah, I thought it would just be a cool way to kind of mix things up. And it was really great having feedback from someone whose songs I really love. So, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, talk to me more about that experience. What was it kind of like working with him, you know, setting up those kind of classes? And I think you kind of put some demos together as well as a result of that. Yeah, so, I mean, um, most of the records, I guess it was almost like pre-production, but not under such a name, but um, I would give him the credit for that. (laughs) But um, I think, like, having someone external to bounce ideas off of prior to, like, building a song was invaluable in terms of just breaking out of, I mean, I don't know if you do much writing in terms of, like, musical stuff yourself, but I find that it's quite easy to get stuck in certain patterns of songwriting so if you if you get comfortable with a with a way to write a song then you might be more inclined to go back and revisit songwriting in that same way which can kind of for me it feels like um stagnate creativity or you know just the approach can kind of limit what you might be able to come out with so i think i wanted to be able to shake that up a bit and reapproach songwriting in a completely different way with someone who I'd never worked with before, who has different, you know, influences and frames of reference for their process and the way they do things. And, you know, the way I saw it was like, there's always things you can learn. I think like, I'm always trying to trying to learn more from other people whose work I like or I'm inspired by, even if I don't like it. And, you know, just, um, yeah, keep on expanding. And 
I guess, shifting the boundaries of what we sound like, I guess. So, yeah. That's kind of um, something that I think, not just kind of music, any creative output, if you're kind of, especially you, um, as a band, kind of like a DIY kind of project, you can kind of sometimes have like blinkers and you don't, you know, you know this way and, and you're comfortable with that. And sometimes it's a bit, you know, you can be a bit apprehensive to to try different things that you're not as familiar with. Yeah, hundred percent. I think like it's easy to get comfortable and <laughs> I don't ever feel that comfortable being comfortable. <laughs> um, so I, I like to try and change things up as, as much as possible, really, in yeah. terms of at least the approach. So, yeah, it was great working with Dylan. So some of the songs that we did together were like, I Wish I Was Dead and Rotting Mass and Rental Song. That, they came out as some of my favourite tracks on the record. What were kind of like some of the biggest like lessons and tips that you think you'll be taking forward for records beyond this? Biggest lessons and tips. Don't be afraid to do weird stuff. I think like there's more weird stuff on this record than there's, and we've done some weird stuff on our records before. Like we've had uh, made some strange choices, but it's always been within a kind of nervous shaped box. But I feel like the nervous shaped box is a different <laughs> shape on this record, if that makes sense. So yeah, I think just like, pushing it a bit and doing things that maybe you aren't so comfortable or even maybe aren't so convinced by, because I feel like a lot of the time when you, well, I find this, I'm not going to speak for every person in a band, but a lot of the time I feel like when I'm writing, I'm worried about how it might be received. So we try to just kind of shake that off entirely for this record yeah, and just, just do, do whatever we wanted basically. Um, and while we've sort of done whatever we wanted on previous records, it's always been with the kind of like, okay, this is what this is the kind of band we are. This is what kind of music we make. Whereas this record, we kind of shed that and did actually what we wanted without worrying about what kind of band we kind of came across as. So yeah, so you kind of not not I don't I guess not like rewriting the the nervous rule book, but kind of adjusting it to a twenty twenty two world, you know, post COVID world, I guess. Yeah, for sure, and just expanding expanding that sound so that we do sound like that but we also sound like this you know yeah um gives us more room i guess yeah just cre- creating that room to be a bit more creative and do different things when you, you know obviously you've said um that you kind of tried some different stuff some some weird stuff and you know did some things that you weren't 100 percent comfortable with at the time was there any kind of things that you did try that didn't quite make the record because it was kind of a bit too out there no, actually, we have a strange thing where uh, everything goes on the record. So I mean, we've we've released like we've released four albums in I guess six years, as well as another six tracks that have gone on um, EPs and stuff, which is like forty six songs, which is pretty much everything we've written, save for a couple of tunes. So like we tend to just make the songs work, and even if they're weird, <laughs> we put them out anyway, uh, <laughs> um, because yeah. You know, waste not, want not. You don't, you don't want too many s- spare songs hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, and you, you don't know like s- some things land better than you think they would land as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, talk to me about more the you know. So I believe you guys self-produced the record, and you went to Northumberland. You went, was it in a like a studio or someone's someone's home? Yeah. So Jack's built a studio in his uh, garage, and uh, right. he sort of he tracked all the drums, and then everyone came up, and we we put the whole record together ourselves. So um, it was, yeah, kind of like revisiting the way that we made Permanent Rainbow, our first record, because we re- we self-produced that one as well. So yeah, kind of taking it back to that that approach was was really interesting, yeah, um, and fun to do as well. I think like we've we've not really strayed that far from that in terms of the stuff we've done, because I think like with Tough Crowd was the only one that was entirely produced by someone else, um, which was Neil Kennedy. But with, with Everything Dies. Bob Cooper recorded the drums and then we recorded the rest of the record ourselves and then Bob mixed it. So it's kind of like we've always kind of had that in our arsenal, which is partly why we're still able to be a band, I guess, because we can afford to do things a little cheaper. And yeah, I think going back and doing that experience and and hanging out and making music together um, just as a band again, which was kind of nearly the first time we've seen each other in about a year and a half as well because obviously we live all quite far away from each other right. um it was excellent it was really good so there's a lot of kind of pre-production done like you say you guys are kind of 
different parts of the country uh, was a lot of it done remotely over emails and and zoom and stuff like that or was it kind of you wrote the massive bulk of the song and then you went into the studio fixed it up to obviously what it is on the record a little of both i think like we we tend to approach writing like i'll come up with the i'll come up with the basic idea for a song and then everyone will go away and create their parts and then we'll come back and put it all together in the studio so yeah we kind of knew exactly what we were going in to do which is handy so i I mean, Jack did the drums in a couple of days and then when we turned up, I think we managed to do the whole of the rest of the record in five days. That's quick. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, <isn't> it? <laughs> yeah, so it was it was definitely like quick. There's lots to do. But I think like you, when you have like a limited amount of time like that, you kind of capture the energy. And the, I feel like that's definitely part of our process too. I don't think we've ever spent, spent longer than 10 days on a record, to be honest. Yeah. Um, once, in, once we're in the studio, which I think is something that still Steve Albini does as well. Obviously, we're not as good at self-producing as Steve Albini is at <laughs> producing records. <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. But yeah, that's definitely that kind of that kind of approach helps mitigate any time for people to um and ah about like you know if something seems shit or not. So if it is shit, then it's you know it's already too late. <laughs> yeah. And I guess if you're going straight into it and just recording it pretty quickly, like you, you just said you did, I guess you're you're very confident in the material as as it is up until you get into the studio. Like you say, you're not going to kind of um and ah, is this right? Do we extend this? Do we cut this out? Yeah, yeah. I think that the time goes in, the time goes into the the demoing and then, you know, you have a, a few days in the studio to just nail it, get yeah. a vibe. None of us are particularly perfectionists and we don't really labour over labor overtakes and stuff because i think like there's um there's something that gets lost when everything feels super quantized and perfect and we're just not that band um (laughs) we've never been that band and we never will be that band so i think like yeah it's an approach that suits us i think i think that that you you kind of you know touching it there is there's kind of um a good quality to have where it's kind of a little bit rough around the edges and not too perfect. Not to say that obviously you've made like mistakes on the record or, or anything like that, but to say that, you know, overthinking every part of it is kind of, this is it. This is very fresh and organic. Yeah, that's it. I think like, I, and I like all, all the records that I've grown up listening to are kind of like that as well. Right. I think like the, the way we expect records to sound now is very different to what records might have sounded like maybe 20 years ago and like all the stuff that we would probably purport to be inspired by would, would also come into like a bracket of music that just wasn't recorded very well so <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah I think like retaining some of that and uh, not, not not to say that it's not been recorded well because it hasn't yeah. been actually <laughs> but you know like it's not it's not hyper professional it's not like shiny and it, I, it definitely feels more organic. You can like hear that it's a drum kit rather than a bunch of samples. And, you know, I, I think samples have that, have their place, obviously, like for certain types of music, you can, you, you can make it without samples and that's just as much music as anything that doesn't have samples in it. So, but for us, I think it was, it's just nice to be able to hear the room a bit. That kind of leads on to, you know, the next part I want to talk about and, you know, we've kind of, discussed and you know you've, you've kind of explained it in this this conversation just how much of kind of a, a DIY kind of band you are but it's just and you've been that way the whole time you know you've got a kind of a, a punk ethos as well and though the evil one the new record is definitely not a a COVID album or anything do you feel like the less direct effects of COVID such as you know the society responses and the political responses had any influence on what you guys kind of wrote about and talked about because you know you're not a band that kind of shy away from talking about some more important and relevant topics to society and the way things are today yeah I think like definitely I think that realistically the the approach was to try to because I think I feel like one collective collective phenomenon that a lot of people experienced was a kind of difference in the way that we experience time in terms of like time kind of stretching or like people feeling like it's gone really quickly without anything happening so or you know being sat there and being like time is going so slowly and then suddenly being like why is it a year later than I thought it was do you know what I mean so and that kind of experience of time being warped and shifted and um I think like that the isolation from general community activities I don't think there's any many other kind of disasters that 
humanity might face where you might be required to actually isolate from one another. I think that in terms of um, a communicable disease like that, that's probably one of the only times it would happen. But I think they definitely played a part in, I guess, like the thematic formation of the record. I think like one of the key things I try and speak to in, in terms of lyrics is a kind of rejection of individualism. And I think that was partly born of... I guess mutual aid efforts in response to certain, you know, events happening, be it the pandemic, being like um, like Black Lives Matter and uprising in the US, or be it any of the number of things that have happened politically over the last two years. I think like it's become more obvious that you don't get much done on your own, and I think that's definitely something that I try and speak to on the record. So yeah, not not a COVID record, but I think yeah. that I think that the even now where COVID's obviously still very much with us, but everything's supposedly back to normal. It's very much not back to normal. Yeah. And I think like, yeah, the changes in the way that I think generally people think about issues like that that we tend to sing about in terms of like community or being you know, resisting kind of hate or oppression or repression in various ways. I think that people tend to have, whether for better or for worse, different opinions on those things from when the pandemic started. So yeah, it's definitely inspired by that. Not not a pandemic record, like you say, but yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of hard with the way that the pandemic was. Even if we don't want to say that we want to talk about it or influ- influenced by it or affected by it, we are. And as you kind of said, the pandemic still is happening, whether people really agree with it or not. Is it the same way as it was, you know, a year ago? No, but kind of the aftershock effects are still ongoing and I think will be for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people died, which is something that seems to be quite readily glossed over now which I think is a little bit difficult to compute. I think like in terms of the way that you see people who were practically the saviors of the nation two years ago are now being derided in the media as being not worth a 7% pay increase with the the rail workers strikes that you've got going on literally today. Like yeah. I, I think that the a lot of the people with the British media specifically as well seem to think that we have kind of collective amnesia on a massive scale and I don't think that is the case I think like people haven't forgotten the pandemic people haven't forgotten the impact that it made on their lives and people don't haven't forgotten the fact that you know there are people who worked through that who risked their lives further for next to no money to make sure that society in in air quotes could still function but I think like the fact that now people are kind of being told well actually you don't you shouldn't ask for a shouldn't ask for a raise or you shouldn't um you know these these greedy rail workers that mm. the nurses only get paid this much. This is how much the rail workers get paid. Yeah. Like it wasn't so long ago that they like nurses were denied a pay rise. So it's not that people are like, well, you know, why shouldn't nurses get paid more? But nurses are literally asking to be paid for more, yeah. paid more money and aren't getting it. So what, that's no benchmark. And I think that the way that people in these positions have been treated following on from the pandemic and this kind of cost of living aftershock that's been compounded by obviously Russia's war in Ukraine. I think that people are at a point where they're more aware of how fucked everything is than they maybe have been in a long time, even yeah. though that that people are still trying to say, oh no, everything's fine. You just, you know, keep on, you know. Yeah. Everything's even the, chill. Even like the, the slap in the face of, of the whole party gate thing. Yeah. <laughs> like how, how, I can't even have any words for it. No, I feel I feel like like that's that's generally how people feel. But obviously, how people feel is presented by I guess like um, newspapers and TV news and stuff. And, and I think that they represent the way that the nation feels or try and influence the public mood in a certain way that isn't quite quite sticking. And that's I think one of the biggest aftershocks of that. And I mean, like we don't even speak explicitly to any of these issues really on our record. Yeah. Because I think that one of the things we wanted to do was, like I was saying about in terms of people experiencing time in a different way, we didn't want to be quite as explicit in in terms of how we approach lyrical themes because we didn't want to necessarily nail it to a point in time. Because I think the approach to lyricism on Tough Crowd was kind of more direct and more relevant to things that were actually happening at that point and more explicitly about certain things, which you know, was a deliberate decision at the time and one that I stand by. But I, I think that um, 
because of the way that time seemed to be moving so so quickly and also so slowly, we didn't necessarily want to pin this record, The Evil One, to a certain point in time, which, yeah. which is why you can kind of hear, or at least I think you can hear, influences from music from decades ago as well as music from a couple of years ago, as well as it being like very much a record that's released in 2022. So we, we kind of wanted to play with that idea of stretching time and not necessarily pinning it to a certain point in time so that... Not that, not to say we've made a timeless record, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just not like but, stamped with a date. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, which, which can make things dated pretty quickly if you do something like that. Yeah, definitely. Talk to me a bit more about the album title and also, you know, the the artwork for the Evil One, along with the title of the album itself, and even on the artwork with you know the, the band logo. There's kind of like a, a metal influence in there. What yeah. kind of made you want to go for that kind of aesthetic choice for this one? Uh, just for just just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I think like um, like Renata, who did the artwork, does a bunch of like stuff for like hardcore bands, and the aesthetics are just super cool. Um, we, like we all listen to a lot of metal ourselves in in Nervous anyway. So like the, our first, I mean, the first Nervous records, the first Nervous release actually was a covers EP. Right. It has a, like a cover of Entombed and a cover of Obituary on it. Right. So we've never we've never like shied away from, I guess, the influence of like heavy music or, or metal on, on what we write. And and yeah. in terms of the title, uh, we just nicked that of Rocky Erickson, <laughs> which is if you haven't heard the if you haven't heard Rocky Erickson's album The Evil One, you should go and listen to it because it's the absolute best. It's like a seventies kind of psychedelic rock album. And it's all about monsters. So yeah, partly why we named it the Evil One was so that we could tell everyone about Rocky Erickson's album of the same name, <laughs> and make sure people go and listen to that because it's uh, it's the absolute best. But yeah, I guess it's just like a, I guess it's just like a sort of tongue in cheek homage to things that we like, and yes. also just a bit of fun. I think yeah. like some of the comments were like, some of the comments when we released the first single were like, oh. This doesn't sound anything like how it looks. Like, <laughs> well, especially like a grindcore album or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that and 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 also again, it's like I guess playing into the whole idea of like not really being bothered by people's expectations of it. Yeah. To the point <laughs> to the point where you're actually just fucking with people's expectations of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the short answer to that is just just for fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, next time you just need to get like a super cliche pop yeah. boy or girl band album going on and <laughs> in the cover and see what people say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What kind of metal have you been listening to lately then? What kind of stuff have you been listening to that's kind of on the heavier side? Do you know what? I've been listening to a band, a lot of a band called Burn in Hell. They're like an Australian band. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. No, but that sounds like a very metal band name. <laughs> yeah, they're absolutely excellent. What else have I been listening to? Aside from Burn in Hell, I guess the closest things like the last uh, Backwash record, I Lay Here Buried with My Rings and My Dresses, I think that's called. What else is planned for, for Nervous in 2022? I think you've got a tour with the Dead Notes in October, is that right? Yeah, so we've got 2,000 Trees on the 5th of July. I think, yeah. no, maybe 7th, I can't remember. Uh, the July. first week of July, anyway. Early yeah. July. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we've got a show at the Victoria in Dalston with um, a bunch of bands like uh, slash fiction and brutaligators that's called how to make friends fest which was like a, a diy kind of collective that formed off the back of i guess covid and like people just chatting and there's a bunch of like really good uk diy emo bands playing that so we're playing that that's on the 16th of july then yeah we got that tour with the dead notes um uk and eu happening in september, september. which is going to be awesome and then hopefully some US dates as well in the fall, as they call it. Yes, over there, that's what they call it. <laughs> that's what they call it, yeah. <laughs> I never knew what, like, when they say the fall, what does that mean? Because it's kind of like when people say, oh, I'll see you late afternoon. It's just very vague. I think, it, I I, th- I guess it it must ref- refer to... Um, Autumn, I guess. Yeah, leaf senescence. As it's, uh, <laughs> I study environmental science, so yeah, leaf, leaf senescence. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when the chlorophyll disappears from leaves and they fall onto the floor, I guess it's just named after that. Right. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, uh, but yeah, yeah. U- US US in the fall, and uh, yeah, beyond that remains to be seen. To be honest, at this point, 
Have you got any final words before I let you go and enjoy the sun and the beer garden? Uh, you want to plug? No, actually. That's kind of it. Yeah, no, that's that's everything. So, yeah, thank you for thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you no for problem. No problem. No problem. Thanks for taking the time out. Best of luck with the album release, I'm sure. It'll go great. I'm sure I'll catch you guys at some point. Yeah, give us a shout if you're around. Will do. Nice one. Thank you. See you later. No worries. See you Bye. later. Bye. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider supporting the podcast in any way that you can. We have a Patreon where you can get access to each episode a week early, along with some other perks, a merch store, or you can leave a review wherever you're listening to this. You can also follow me on social media or subscribe to the newsletter where I'll send out each episode to you via email, along with regular playlists. All of this can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. Thanks again for listening, and remember, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle.